It's a commonly accepted theory in storytelling that in order to keep an audience engaged, the stakes need to escalate. This is demonstrably untrue. It's probably more accurate to say that to keep the audience from getting bored, the story shouldn't repeat itself too often. One way to do that is raising the stakes. The heroes overcome a decently difficult challenge and are then faced with a bigger challenge they can't solve the same way, and so ad infinitum. Of course, a challenge doesn't need to be bigger to challenge the characters, it just needs to be different in some way. There are a full dozen Miss Marvel novels, 33 Hercule Poirot mysteries, and six 60 Sherlock Holmes stories, and they don't get more perilous the further they go. They're just different mysteries every time with different solutions. But there are genres of storytelling where threats don't really have this lateral movement, and instead function on a kind of linear scale. In these stories, while antagonists might have special abilities or weird quirks complicating things, ultimately threats only have one metric that matters, raw power. The heroes have a certain level of power, and can correspondingly be expected to defeat any threat below that level of power. If you're introducing a new threat that you want the audience to believe is an actual problem, it needs to be above that level of power. And that, of course, means that the hero's powers and techniques and skills will just bounce off them harmlessly. The archetypical instance of this is, naturally, Dragon Ball Z's power levels, which metatextually is a rather depressing example of becoming the very thing you have sworn to destroy, because early Dragon Ball had a concept of strength that was very heavily dependent on technique. Characters in combat with each other would have different abilities that could counter each other in different ways, like using the solar flare to blind even very strong opponents, or a gimmick villain whose whole deal was that he was really stinky, being countered by the fact that Krillin canonically has no nose. Brute force was rarely the solution, which makes sense for a story centered on martial arts. But in this world of training and techniques and slow methodical practice, the wild card from the very beginning was Goku, who started the story already bulletproof and went up from there. Almost everyone else was a pretty much regular human who had to train their powers from nothing, but Goku had this weird natural advantage that nobody really understood. He was much stronger and tougher than any kid could be expected to be, and of course, under certain circumstances, he could turn into a giant gorilla. Add training on top of that, and you have a recipe for a protagonist who can basically win any fight given enough lead time, and that's before they added the thing about Saiyans getting stronger every time they almost die. In the first arc of Dragon Ball Z, things took a bit of a turn when Goku's alien nature was revealed and we met other Saiyans that had all of Goku's natural advantages, but much better. And for the first time, Goku ended up scraping by with nothing but technique where he'd previously had the advantage of brute force. This is a cool reversal that doesn't last very long. Since since once the term Super Saiyan starts getting thrown around, Goku just starts climbing the power ladder, getting stronger and stronger and overtaking everyone else. The Frieza fight is a bit of a return to form, since Goku is faced with overwhelming power and tries a number of clever techniques to circumvent it, like exploiting the fact that Frieza can't sense his presence and is thus limited to only attacking him when he can see him, but every time he ekes out the slightest progress, Frieza just powers up a little bit more and pulls away again. When this arc introduces the concept of power levels, it is originally exclusively in the context of the bad guys underestimating their opponents. A power level can tell them how physically strong their enemy is, but not how skilled. And all the Earth-based fighters have crazy techniques they've honed over the years that are where all their actual power comes from. The idea that you can put a numerical value on strength and use that to know who's gonna win a fight is framed as a bit of a culture clash that results in the alien villains being frequently blindsided by their Earthly opponents. The problem is, in this very intriguing clash of training versus talent and skill versus power, Frieza is overwhelming power that no amount of technique can overcome. And as soon as the Super Saiyan enters the field, the conflict becomes power versus power. And once a story's conflict structure is power versus power, it is very difficult to make it anything else. The question then becomes how the heroes are supposed to defeat a threat that they demonstrably can't beat. In order to pose a problem in this paradigm, it must be stronger than them. But if strength is the only thing that matters, the heroes are straight up out of luck until and unless they find a way to get stronger. To highlight a threat's overwhelming force, it's often demonstrated in the narrative that clever techniques or special moves won't work on them to really drive home how scary they are. Under these circumstances, a writer has only two options for defeating them, exploiting a weak point or overwhelming them with even more force. Exploiting a weak point only works if they have a weak point, which can seem a little contrived, but if they do, the problem is solved. The clever heroes just need to find the weak point and there's no power escalation required. But some threats are just ridiculously powerful with no downsides, and in order to defeat them, the heroes need overwhelming power of their own. And this is the context where we find the power-up. Now, typically, heroes become more powerful gradually, through practice, training, and other broadly realistic approaches to getting better at something. A power-up occurs when, instead of slowly building up more skill, the hero's ability takes a discreet leap. They jump from one level of strength slash skill slash ability to a higher one without much of an intervening state. Now, this is not actually 100% unrealistic. Sometimes someone's ability is being hampered by a mental block or an untreated medical condition or a similar issue that they have to find a way to work through or fix. But the fact is, most of the time, people in the real world get better at stuff through slow, methodical, hard 
work. They don't just suddenly get stronger or faster or better at chess or whatever. But in fiction, specifically fiction that lays out its threats on a linear scale and says must be this strong to continue, power-ups are a writer's best friend. Your heroes are losing, and the story drives home that they are, in fact, doomed to lose, so how can you make them win? You've already shown that the villain is indestructible, ludicrously powerful, and mere inches from victory. Your hero doesn't have time to go hit the gym. But they have something more important. You. You, the writer, have the power to grant them the boon they so desperately need. And so, with the stroke of a pen, you do. The love of their friends, or a nugget of hidden true potential, or a secret bloodline technique, or a choosy magical artifact, or a little kissy kiss from their love interest suddenly stirs to life, and the hero finds themselves detonating scouters worldwide as their power spikes off the scale. Now, stronger than the bad guy, the hero defeats the bad guy, and all is right with the world. All thanks to the power-up you so graciously bestowed. Now, if a writer does this too often, that's how you get power creep, where the constant threat escalation leads to a gradual loss of relevancy for all the unfortunate deuteragonists that just can't keep up. But let's ignore those for now. Instead, let's talk about the different kinds of power-ups and how our heroes can go about narratively earning them so it doesn't feel like you, the writer, are fully cheating. See, the problem with a power-up is by its very nature, it kinda hits the narrative out of nowhere. If the audience knows it's coming, the fight up to that point doesn't register as a tense, desperate battle, but as a waiting game for the hero to get their act together and unlock more true potential or whatever. But if the audience has no idea it's coming, when it does hit, it can feel like a textbook deus ex machina that potentially undercuts a more interesting solution. To prevent this, most stories will hint at or build up the power-up beforehand to sort of plant the idea that this character has more potential than they're currently tapping into. And in the critical moment when the power-up hits, the character will have a moment of revelation or personal growth or some other thing they have actual agency in to make the power-up feel like a reward for quick thinking or hard work or character development. Or in cases where the power-up is the result of something like pure unbridled rage, it'll make it feel like a really good opportunity for the hero to make the bad guy cathartically suffer. And as a quick side note, the idea that a character needs to earn their power-up only applies to good guys. Bad guys can get randomly stronger whenever. This is because stories tend to be structured as a series of problems and solutions, and while a problem dropping in out of nowhere just presents the opportunity for more story, a solution dropping out of the blue feels like cheating the audience out of a story. So there are several ways a character can narratively earn their power-up. A classic one is having a loved one in danger. Frequently, this manifests if the bad guy has been absolutely wrecking the hero up till now, and then threatens to turn their attention on the typically much less badass supporting cast and love interest. The impetus behind this power-up is generally the idea that this character is more motivated to protect their loved ones than they are to protect themselves, which is a nice little character moment, especially if this character isn't particularly good at showing that they care. Typically, the hero will then experience a burst of indescribable fury and a corresponding power-up, which in some cases takes the form of a full-on super-powered evil side, since even if the motivation is protecting loved ones, the emotional component of rage tips the scales a little in the maybe kind of bad direction. These power-ups are typically temporary, and they function as a kind of juiced-up version of hysterical strength. Relatedly, sometimes power-ups are caused by a near-death experience. The hero gets absolutely walloped, sometimes as a result of a heroic sacrifice, but sometimes just because, you know, they're facing an overwhelmingly powerful threat head-on, and this is kind of what you would expect to happen. As the character fades out, an empowering entity, or a choosy magical artifact, or their own subconscious, or a dormant secret bloodline, or the story itself, decides to reward their sacrifice with a nice little boost, so they survive the experience and come back swinging. This is often loosely justified as some kind of fail-safe for survival mode or adrenaline, or their body just acting on raw instinct with no limitations or whatever, but practically speaking, the justification is the hero was straight up about to die, what do you want? This does have overlap with the power-ups a character earns by proving their worth. The character does something notably heroic, like a heroic sacrifice, but frequently much less deadly, and it proves to a choosy artifact or empowering entity that they are worthy of the power-up. These power-ups are more frequently permanent and function as basically level-up rewards for general good guy stuff, though the hero might in some cases need to do some heavy lifting to acclimate to the new power-up, which as a bonus helps make it feel like they actually kinda earned it instead of it just being handed to them. Now, sometimes a character gets powers from an empowering entity that grants them new abilities because granting abilities is their whole deal, but sometimes the power-up is structured a little bit differently. Sometimes, instead, the hero gets their power-up by absorbing power from another source. A magical resource, a slain enemy, power donated by their allies, the heroic sacrifice of a friend. While there are a lot of ways to flavor it, ultimately the impact is the same. The character acquires more power by taking it from a source that has power. The equation balances out pretty well. This is more often than not a temporary thing, and is sometimes explicitly bad for them, which adds a ticking clock to the fight since they won't be able to keep it up for long. But sometimes it's permanent, especially when it involves something like absorbing somebody's soul. Also, bad guys sometimes do this one to highlight how evil they are, but it's okay and, like, cool when the good guys do it. But not every power-up comes from an outside source. Sometimes it instead follows a moment of revelation, where the characters figure something out, either about their enemy or about themselves, and this allows them to unlock some hidden potential they had. It might be accompanied by a battle in the center of the mind to visually represent
represent the internal struggle, or it might be motivated by a friendship speech, or it could just be a little aha moment where something clicks for the hero and suddenly everything gets easier. Now this is all pretty dope, but this is also where we start to find the power was within you all along, which is definitely not always bad, and it can be a fun reveal, especially if the character overcomes a self-worth issue or processes a trauma or is just really jazzed about the power of friendship and is rewarded by becoming a highly capable badass, but it can be kind of annoying if it seems like the tipping point for the character's sudden burst of power doesn't really go any deeper than they just decided they could do it now. And on a similar note, sometimes the power-up is only a power-up from the perspective of the audience. Not only was the power within the hero all along, the hero was aware of this and was actively choosing not to use it yet. This usually hits after the character has done a lot of training off-screen and is easing back into things, or has had their power actively restrained by some outside force, like training weights or magical bindings. So instead of getting a power-up, the character reveals their true strength, typically accompanied by the sentiment that it's about time they stop holding back. This can be a cool moment, but these power-ups usually won't be enough to solve the main thread of the story, since if the hero shows up already able to fix everything, the rest of the story kind of becomes a foregone conclusion. So while this power-up will let the hero show off their power and skill, they usually won't get to use it to beat anything stronger than the bad guy's right-hand man. Defeating the actual main threat will usually still require a more traditional power-up or something like clever tactics, power friendship, or a good old-fashioned deus ex machina. This touches on a broader point about power-ups, which is that while they can be acquired through training, and in fact it makes the most sense for that to happen, the dramatic needs of the story generally dictate that preparation and training can never be enough to let the hero win. And the reason for that is pretty simple. If the hero enters the final boss fight already able to win in a way the audience already knows what to expect, the fight doesn't amount to much more than a waiting game. This is the same reason that a heist planned on screen always has to go wrong, and the heroes are more likely to succeed if the audience hasn't heard their plan yet. If the audience already knows what's going to happen and exactly how it's going to happen, why should the story even bother to show it? That's basically a story breaking the don't repeat yourself rule in the absolute most fundamental way. So typically, the final fight needs some kind of surprise that serves as a catalyst to the final power-up. The moment of revelation or the dramatic loved one endangering or the friendship speech or the absorbing power from an unexpected source, they all work as the wild card to keep the fight fresh and unpredictable. But while this is great from a Doyleist perspective, constantly seeking to surprise and thrill the audience can cause problems that degrade the integrity of the world and the story's internal Watsonian rules. This is where power creep comes in, but that's not the only problem that power-ups can expose. There's a sort of serialized escalation that follows from establishing a power-up mechanic in story when it's coupled with the general rule that a story shouldn't repeat itself. The power-up the hero worked and slaved and maybe even literally died for is only going to work once. The next bad guy needs to be even stronger, even harder to beat, because the story has established a paradigm where the only way to make an enemy interesting is to make them immune to everything the heroes can already do. And because if they didn't do that, it would be weird that the hero didn't just use their big finisher final move right at the beginning. This is taking no repetition to a level of extreme that is both unnecessary and actively harmful to the impact of the plot, because it essentially constantly hits the protagonist with the wharf effect. If their powers don't do anything to any of the threats they face until they get the power-up they need and win immediately, it feels like they may as well not be doing anything at all. For all their alleged complexities and flashy special effects, fights in this structure amount to very long games of you can't hurt me, I have my everything proof shield. Now there are a bunch of ways to avoid this. Instead of sticking the new bad guy behind a force field to explain why the last season's power-up won't work anymore, the hero's power-up could have a drawback, like a long charge time, an associated super-powered evil side, a complex requirement for activation, or a debilitating effect on them so that if it doesn't work they'll be taking themselves out of the fight. All these indicate that using the power-up would actually be tactically disadvantageous until they're out of other options. Or you can put the threat behind a series of complex defenses that can't just be busted down, and once they actually get to the bad guy then whacking them isn't too hard. Or the threat can be more lateral. A power-up that lets the hero hit harder won't work on a threat that's psychic or intangible or extremely long range or entangled in complex political machinations. And even if the threat is just stronger and tougher than the hero, it doesn't mean the hero categorically can't win or needs to become stronger and tougher than them to win. It is honestly so funny to me that shonen action anime is in large part inspired by martial arts movies because the idea that a physically superior opponent can be defeated by skill, precision, hone technique, and practice is the entire goddamn point of martial arts. But these problems are mostly in the long term, narratively speaking. They arise after the story has already established the power-up, when it's struggling to justify more threats posing a problem after the power-up. The power-up itself is normally pretty awesome, especially if it's been suitably built up, the hero feels like they both really need and deserve the boost, and the antagonist about to get whacked by it has been proven to be a real asshole the audience wants to see taken down a peg. In the same way that a deus ex machina that rescues the heroes can still be very satisfying if the audience just really wanted the heroes to be rescued and they don't care how, a power-up that turns the tables can be a very cool moment, but it can also fall flat, and that usually happens when the only thing the power-up does is let the hero
heroes win. Most really impactful power-up moments have a secondary meaning lifting them up, like if the hero's power boost comes from them finally processing that they aren't alone anymore, or overcoming some kind of lasting trauma or loose end that's been causing them pain. Or it comes at the cost of another character's tragic sacrifice, or it has a scary undercurrent like a super-powered evil side or an uncontrollable rage that makes the audience and the supporting cast wonder if this power boost is a good thing or another problem they have to fight. Methods like these add a layer of meaning to the story that isn't just gradually increasing the power bar until it hits the you-can-beat-the-bad-guy-now mark. This is why the idea of a protagonist earning their power-up is so important, because otherwise it just feels like a contrivance to solve a problem the writer contrived to be unnecessarily unsolvable. Power-ups without this narrative layer tend to fall flat, and the shakiest cases tend to take two specific forms. The true power was friendship, and the true power was within you all along. Unless the protagonist has been explicitly written with an arc about overcoming isolation and loneliness through the acceptance of their friends, the power of friendship feels pretty vapid as a justification because it's not a change. These characters have typically been friends for most of the story at this point. It's not clear why saying it out loud is what causes the boost, except, again, in cases where the protagonist has been struggling with loneliness and really needed to hear it confirmed that their friends genuinely like them and want them to succeed. And on the subject of power-ups that aren't a change, the most blatant offender is the power was within you all along. To be clear, this power-up can work very well. In most cases, it hits best in stories where the character has a badass weapon they relied on and they recently lost that weapon, and they've consequently been grappling with feeling powerless and fighting their own muscle memory whenever they try to do anything combat-based, or when a character with a power they can't control fails and disappoints people, which also works to make them feel powerless and bad. When these characters realize that the true power was within them all along, it's after struggling through loss and a feeling of weakness and failure that makes the revelation a welcome affirmation. When this doesn't happen, you get stories where a character has struggled through plot difficulties and inconveniences that their powers would render trivial to resolve, and then they realize, or are told at the last possible moment, that they can actually fix everything whenever they want. And then they do. Where's the change? Like, what actually tangibly happens in this character's head that makes them suddenly able to do this thing they haven't been able to do at all? The power was in you all along is a plot twist that feels like a change, but by its nature, it reveals that there is no change. And unlike the stop holding back variant, the hero usually doesn't even exercise any agency in unleashing their power. It's kind of the truest expression of the trouble this trope has with hitting the audience. Unless the power-up comes from an outside source like a magical entity, a choosy artifact, or absorbing another form of power, the power-up by its nature comes from within in the character. In a sense, the power has always been inside them all along because it had to come from somewhere and there aren't that many options. Which means the character always had the potential to be able to solve this problem easily. Which begs the question, why did it take them so long? Serialized stories that rely on power-ups for threat scaling frequently make less and less sense in hindsight, as the same character struggling against Baby's first villain of the week apparently had enough hidden true potential to single-handedly fight and kill God four seasons later. The power-up is a powerful trope perhaps too powerful, and it must be used very responsibly to avoid destabilizing the very fabric of the plot, unless it would look really cool. So, yeah.